Hello everyone and uh, thank you for joining me via YouTube for this little series of teachings uh, for my doctoral studies and to just thank you for being a part of this academic journey with me. With me. I am so gratefully honored that you would take the, the valuable time to invest into learning more about music and worship. This is the very last semester of my doctoral studies and I could not complete this last semester without your help. And uh, so thank you. Now, as we all know, I'm not some professional videographer or person who's generally on camera. So uh, just pardon the guy here on the other side of the, of the lens here that uh, we'll get through this and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, uh, you'll actually learn something toward the end if we're all uh, happy and lucky. So this particular course, it's kind of a long title, is called The Sacred Actions and Ministries of Worship. The Sacred Actions and Ministries of Worship. Now, somewhat to be clear, in the academic space, the word music uh, could be worshipful, but worship does not necessarily equate to music. And many times in churches these days, when you hear the word worship, uh, many times people immediately think of music. But as, as we know, there are so many more aspects to worship than music. However, in this particular exercise, in this uh, exercise of this course, this particular assignment that uh, I'm working on here, I am specifically talking about uh, music in worship. So just kind of making that clear there. Uh, I'll be addressing music as a sacramental idea or an ordinance, which to uh, most areas out there isn't a readily accepted or even considered idea. So it's kind of carving out some new space in a sense, or at least it's just not being talked about very much specifically. So uh, I, I love having you as part of this journey with me. So if you grew up in church, it's highly likely that your church had things that they would call sacraments or ordinances, such as water baptism, communion, or the Lord's Supper, or, or even Eucharist, depending on your worship tradition as a young person, uh, even foot washing, and in a further list of potential sacred actions, sacraments, or ordinances that uh, your church could have recognized. And so a sacrament is essentially an outward response to an inward grace. It's a sign uh, to remind us of something that Christ did for us. Yeah, you know, and, and ordinance is, is also done out of obedience of Christ's example. For instance, Christ desired to be baptized. And so for that sign, uh, we too uh, choose to be baptized. Uh, he, he gave us an example of being baptized. Christ par, partook a meal with his disciples, his friends, you know, there right before he was crucified. And so we too partake in a meal with our church family to remind us of the sacrifice that Christ uh, did for us. Christ's feet were washed. And so in many traditions, uh, foot washing is a, is a regular ordinance of the church. And so we too can wash each other's feet as a sign of humility and worship before him. So to, the, to, the, that, to that premise and to this project, uh, over and over again in scripture, we are told to worship with our voices and our musical instruments and even with a dance. And so through these actions, communion, baptism, foot washing and others, there is a supernatural presence of God that's with us as, as we do this in, in remembrance of him. And so this, I believe, uh, also extends to us as we are worshiping through music. Some many, many years ago, a, a comment was made to Robert Weber. Uh, Bob was the founder of the academic institution that I'm getting my doctorate through. And uh, this person said to him a, a statement regarding the presence of God in music. And the quote goes like this. Face it, Bob, for the first time in 1,500 years of Christianity, it was taught the presence of God was in the Eucharist or in communion with the Lord's Supper. 
the reformers moved the presence of God from the Eucharist to the word or in, or in the preaching. Today, the new revolution in worship is locating the presence of God in music. This was a very profound shift in thinking for Bob. It even challenged him. So this project will unpack the idea that uh, music in worship is a sacramental or ordinance uh, type of action, and we'll, we'll separate it out into three parts. First, we'll look at the scriptures, a biblical perspective. Then we'll look through history, what has uh, happened over time that maybe points toward this idea. And then we'll also look at the writings of several theologians. What, what are they saying about this idea? So this is going to be fun, I promise, at least I hope it will be. And at the conclusion of these videos, there will be one more survey that I will have you com complete. Um, so, so here we go. So first, we will look now to a biblical perspective of music in worship as sacramental. Here we go. <laughs> Hello and welcome to our first official part of the teaching and this is on the biblical perspective of music and worship as sacramental. Again, thanks for uh, for joining me and uh, being here with us. Uh, you know, many of the scriptures talk about music and worship as well as us being encouraged and or commanded to even sing. And through this exposition, these next uh, few minutes, we're gonna be looking at three particular sets of scripture for this project. And there'll be Psalm 150, 2 Chronicles 5, and Colossians 3. So first, let's look at Psalm 150. You know, it's assumed that uh, David uh, has written the Psalms, but matter of fact, David has only written many of the Psalms. When it comes to Psalm 150, we're actually not too sure who wrote that particular chapter, but it is assumed that Psalm 150 was written you know, sometime between the time of David and up through the, the captivity in Babylon. So there was a good window there of time that uh, this particular chapter could have been written. All of the Psalms were composed to be sung and were compiled by the Jews, uh, in, much like in a hymn book that we would have today. Matter of fact, the, the Jews referred to the Psalter, which is another term for the Psalms, as their book of songs, or simply songs. So the Jewish people saw them exactly as a, uh, a tool for singing all of the psalms, so that they would sing them. And that was no matter the type of psalm that it was, from a, a song of, uh, of turmoil or a song of thankfulness. Uh, either way, it was, it was put into a, a setting for singing by the Jewish people. And Psalm 150, specifically, sorry, is probably the most quoted of the, the psalms by choir directors, worship leaders, senior pastors, and such when it comes to encouraging us uh, to sing. Psalm 150 tells us this. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with a trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. And let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The psalm is clearly a call to worship for us to sing and, uh, and, and declare our praise, no matter even where the location is. Many Psalms give us a reason to praise, but Psalm 150 points out that it is our responsibility um, of those on the earth, those who have breath, to sing out our praise. And as we sing and play our instruments, we are actually fulfilling the reasoning for our very existence, and that is to worship to spend time with God. And additionally, if we go back and look at Psalm 100 verse two, it, it says to come before the Lord with joyful singing. So our singing has to be joyful. 
doesn't mean it has to sound great, you know, uh, but it does have to be joyful as we come before him. And, and God is looking on our heart, not our talent. And so there's a theologian way back in the fourth century named Cyril, Cyril of Jerusalem. And in his uh, catechetical lectures, as the works have been called, in reference to that, Cyril said this, I am attempting now to glorify the Lord, not to declare him, knowing indeed right well that I must fall short of worthily glorifying him. So there's nothing we can do that will equal up to, uh, you know, uh, what we should what we should be doing in worshiping the Lord. We're always going to fall short because he's, he's that uh, worthy. And, um, you know, looking at the, the concluding phrase of Psalm 150, it says, everything that has breath, everything that has breath. So that is our call, a command, if you will. We are the ones who have breath. So we are told to worship in song. Psalm 150 represents uh, and presents to us our very reason for existence. And in response to why mankind was created, it's been stated by one author, to praise God is to live, and to live is to praise God. Now let's look at our second set of scriptures that we will focus on, and that's 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Tradition holds that Ezra uh, wrote both First and Second Chronicles as well as Ezra and Nehemiah. Now that can't exactly be proven, but looking at the various styles of writing in a period of time, it would appear that Ezra wrote all four books, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Second Chronicles opens with uh, our looking into seeing Solomon's plea to God for wisdom. And so, because of his heart, not only did God grant him wisdom, but God also granted him riches as well. One commentator holds that the wisdom that was granted to Solomon was actually the knowledge to go build the temple. As you recall, uh, David didn't get to build the temple, but Solomon did. And so, either way, this, this wisdom was granted from God. And so, at the completion of the building of the temple, the Ark of the Covenant was brought in. Now, Ezra, uh, the writer of Chronicles, was a Levite, as we can see. And the Levites assisted the priests in worship. And so the, the Hebrew nation founded its relationship with God on temple worship overseen by the priesthood and guided by the worship from these Levites. And so we, we can see from Second Chronicles chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, that, that as they worshiped, and here's what the scripture says, the trumpeters and musicians joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord, accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments. The singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, He is good. His love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. So in the scripture, we see that uh, the, mu the musicians and singers joined in unison, giving thanks. Now, that's probably a challenge for, for many churches across the country anyhow, is, is getting everyone to be in unison. But in the scripture, we saw that that's what happened. As well, as we see the priest not even being able to continue their jobs, uh, their, their ministry duties. Why? Because how God filled the temple. He filled it like a cloud. It's hard to even kind of imagine, we can envision what that probably looked like. Um, but because of the worship that was going on, the unity that was in the temple, God filled the, the, the temple and uh, the leaders, the, the pastors, the, the priests, if you will, could not even continue doing their ministry duties because of how God filled the place with a cloud. Well, I'd love to have seen that. So for our third set of scriptures that we are going to look at, let's look at Colossians chapter 3 specifically. Now, here we have a letter from Paul. And uh, if you remember about the, the time of, of Colossians and why it was written, 
It was written while Paul was in prison and estimated to have been written in Rome around the time of AD, uh, around the 50s or the 60s, not the 1950s or 60s. This is, you know, back from year 50 to 59 or, or 60 to 69. Somewhere in that window is the estimation of when Paul would have written this letter in Rome and uh, had written it to the, to the church in, in Colossae, um, primarily out of his sincere care for uh, what was going on there, false teachings and decept- deceptivity that was going on. So we're not exactly 100% sure what the false teachings, false teachings were that were uh, being taught there in Colossae, but we do know that they were occurring because of Paul's letter to them and encouraging them. So with only four chapters in this particular book, um, Paul is pretty quick to get to the point uh, of the matter in his letter here. In chapter one, and sort of breaking it down, Paul talked about the greatness of Christ and his forgiveness for them. He was really encouraging them and reminding them of the greatness of Christ and, and the offering of atonement and forgiveness that Christ had for them. In the second chapter of Colossians, we find uh, Paul getting to his warning about the false teachers and the the deceptive doctrines that were being taught by these false teachers. In chapter three, Paul begins imploring the church of the things they should do and avoid. Paul encourages the church with these words in chapter three, going at uh, verses 12 through 14. And here's what he said. So, As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing one another with forgiveness and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the words of Christ richly dwell in you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or deed, Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So here in these verses in this particular chapter, we find Paul at the end of his, uh, at the end of all of his chastisement to the church and encouraging the church of the false teachers and the deceptive doctrines. He encourages them in singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So Paul, you know, as we can see here, wasn't concerned with a style or genre, but that they simply lifted their voice to sing and worship as a tool for learning. We can see that, uh, you know, in all wisdom uh, of singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In consideration of, of Paul's admonition to the heart of the worshiper, uh, one writer says, The songs should flow out of gratitude and thanksgiving, come from the heart, and be directed in praise to God. And so, though we are commanded to sing, our intentions, our heart, our spirit must reflect a new life of thankfulness in Christ. As we engage in this thankfulness, the peace of Christ will richly dwell in you, verse 15, which will be inwardly and outwardly reflected in the admonition for us to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in verse 16 to God in worship. So, in conclusion to our biblical perspective of of music and worship, as a sacramental uh, type of action, Just know that we have only scratched the surface in regard to the admonition in the scriptures for us to sing and make worship and make music in worship and how God is present with us 
when we do. So we've only looked at three areas in Scripture to where we are encouraged in Scripture uh, to sing and to make uh, our instruments made known to him in worship. And so in the initial survey that you had to do, for those who didn't realize that Jesus sang, let's look at the end of the story of the Lord's Supper, specifically looking at Matthew 26, 29, and 30. And Christ was saying this, But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then the scripture says, After singing a hymn, they, that would be Christ with the disciples, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That's just one of the examples in scripture and there are others that you can find where it indicates that Christ did, in fact, sing. So Scripture encourages us to sing, and Christ even did it for us as an example. So for next video, next we'll be looking at the historical perspective of music in worship as sacramental. All right, here we go. Hello and welcome back to part two of this project. This is the historical perspective of music and worship as sacramental. I uh, hope you're hanging on and doing okay. Um, the focus within this project, again, is uh, it includes the challenging yet promising premise that the actions in singing and making music can be a sacramental type of response. And so uh, in consideration to what is in essence considered a sacramental action, ev uh, evangelical theologian James White writes, ever since New Testament times, the church has found certain sign acts essential for expressing the encounter between God and humans. These sign acts have signified sacred things and have become ways of expressing through the senses what no physical sense could perceive, God's self-giving. You know, history does not give us a distinct picture of music and worship as a sacramental idea, but there are like breadcrumbs along the way uh, to this type of thinking. We know that God is always at hand, and uh, but music has been shown in history to be a unique conduit between man and God. The following historical case studies um, will give some insight into the thinking of the early church fathers and the power of music as it relates to God in a sacramental type of approach. So we'll look at three particular theologians in time, the case studies uh, kind of around them. The first will be a gentleman called St. Augustine of Hippo. And Hippo has nothing to do with, with the animal. It's the, uh, the area that he was from there, St. Augustine. And then we'll, listen, we'll, we'll uh, dive into uh, a gentleman named um, David of Augsburg. And then we will dive into a little bit of content on Martin Luther. So here we go first with St. Augustine of Hippo. St. Augustine was born around the year 354, that's AD, and lived until around the year 430 AD, of course. Uh, he's now viewed as one of the most revered and read church fathers. Um, he was an early church theologian and Roman Catholic priest, and his writings have actually crossed uh, denominational lines around the world and you know, over through the, the centuries and the years. His most uh, personal and prolific writings would be his, um, what's called the Confessions of St. Augustine. Written in a, uh, in a 40 year period, uh, span up until his death in, in around uh, AD 430. A gentleman named Albert Ottler, a contemporary theologian, said that uh, these writings by Augustine, his confessions, 
are a deliberate effort in the permissive atmosphere of God's felt presence to recall those crucial episodes and events in which he or Augustine can now see and celebrate the mysterious actions of God's previent and provident grace. So in Book 10 of St. Augustine's Confessions, because it's a pretty large work, in Book 10, Augustine's viewpoint and approach to music and worship really develop. In Book 10, St. Augustine states, In those melodies which thy words inspire when sung with a sweet and trained voice, I still find no repose. But it is because of the words which are their life that they gain entry into me. Essentially, St. Augustine was struggling with uh, the music itself covering the meaning of the lyrics. He really struggled with that. And despite that struggle and being distracted by the well-crafted melodies, Augustine ultimately confesses how music is a spiritually moving medium, as you and I well know. After being away from the faith for for a period of time, his writings then begin to tell of his um, associated memories of songs in church and how the words truly moved him. Now, gratefully, he stated as he eventually went on uh, to approve the use of singing in the church so that by the delights of the ear, the weaker minds may be stimulated to a devotional mood. It's hard to believe, but it's this type of history that has actually led to our approach in singing today. Many times it's easy to not think about what's happened in the past that um, even gives space for us singing the way that we do. But it hasn't always been the case. It's just more recent history that we enjoy singing in church the way that we do. Um, Augustine realized the deep connection between music and worship to God as long as the focus was on God and not on man. Sounds like a very similar subject for the modern church. Um, W.J. Torrance Kirby stated uh, of Augustine's confessions that uh, they were to stir up the love of God in order that he, God, might become the object of praise. Confession, it would seem, is necessary to the praise of God. For Augustine, Praise is the expression of the ultimate human desire, namely union with God. So Augustine was saying that as we praise, that there is a union of God that that occurs. That's a great picture. Augustine desired for us to see the connection between the act of music and God's presence. He might not have equated music in worship as sacramental, in the pure sense. But he did acknowledge that something special did occur when we sing in worship. Next, we'll look at a gentleman named David of Augsburg. Now, originally, he was uh, his name was David von Augsburg. Of course, translated for us, David of Augsburg. He lived between the years of 1200 and 1272 A.D., and um, so he was a uh, mid-13th century German Franciscan monk, a theologian, preacher, and writer, David Augsburg. And though he wrote many works, he's best known for his, and this is a very, very long title that I really can't get out very well, but I'm going to say it just for you, and it may take me a couple of times. So he's known best for this work called De Exterius et inter- interiores hominis comp- composition, something like that. Uh, it's translated as spiritual life and progress. This is the greatest work by David Osberg, translated as spiritual life and progress. It was uh, written at first as a series of books for very young friars, and uh, his mission in writing it was to bring instruction and guidance to these future Franciscan uh, monks. He truly was desirous to to discern and learn and teach the spiritual importance of the outward influences on the inward. 
and the inward influences on the outward, meaning how we communicate to God is a reflection of God's manifested presence in us or within us. And to these young friars, um, Augsburg said these words, stand in choir reverently and chant with al alacrity. I had to look up how to pronounce that word. So stand in choir reverently and chant with alacrity and devotion remembering how the angels are with you. So thus to Augsburg, there is a divine presence that is with us as we sing, that the angels are actually around us or with us as we sing. So due to Augsburg's influence, writings, and teachings, even the scribes of his time, they recognized an affinity between theology, uh, divine rhetoric, and the practice of singing. And toward the end of Augsburg's writings, um, he expounded on both thanksgiving and having a voice of praise. One statement Augsburg said, there is an innate relationship between the two, that is thanksgiving and having a voice of praise. When we recognize the gifts that we have been given, we include naturally to praise God with voice and works. One theologian of Augsburg said this, David Augsburg describes the action and singing of praises as the noblest pursuit of the will. Bernard McGinn, a Roman Catholic theologian, religious historian, and spiritual scholar, pointed to Augsburg's notion that as we approach God in worship, as though a posture of sacramental action, God's supernatural presence is reflected in both the natural and the spiritual realms. Augsburg saw that the relationship between music and God, the exterior and the interior, and the desire for future readers to come to the same conclusion that he did. So that's a little bit of history about David von Augsburg. Well, now I'll turn some attention to a gentleman named Martin Luther. Martin Luther is probably a name that you've heard before. And uh, he is the reason, uh, if you really go back in history and look at things, that uh, you and I aren't having this discussion from a Roman Catholic standpoint that... Uh, uh, because of what Martin Luther did in his 95 Theses in the church at Wittenberg uh, that's, that uh, sparked the, the Reformation as we know it now, that you and I aren't Roman Catholic. That's pretty cool to, to think about. Uh, pretty neat story there. So Luther was a German a theologian, a monk, a priest, who had some crazy outrageous ideas in regard to music and worship at least for his day. And uh, so as the one, as I mentioned, responsible for, for, for the launch of the Reformation, uh, Luther lived around the years um, 1483 to 1546. 1483 to 1546. So really not that long ago in, in the midst of uh, uh, recorded history. Luther saw that uh, or felt that uh, uh, music was second only to theology. And I mentioned that question in your initial survey. And Luther could envision a worship experience where everything was sung except for the sermon. So, and unlike St. Augustine that we covered uh, a few minutes ago, who saw music uh, possibly being distracting to the lyrics, um, Luther believed that the emotive value of music was positive and not negative. So th there is a remarkable 55 volumes of Luther's commentary, sermons, and other writings uh, called Luther's Works. You, you can go check it out at, uh, at a library, especially at the Vanderbilt Library, if you'd like to go check that out. And it gives us insight into Luther's thinking in the area of music and worship especially down into the 53rd volume of these 55 uh, works. From Luther's pen, we can read, 
we can mention only one point which experience confirms, namely that next to the word of God, music deserves the highest praise. The Holy Ghost himself honors her as an instrument for his proper work. As the church is comforted and encouraged through song, the Holy Spirit is present. Luther found God's interest so great in music that even God granted different musical abilities to each one of us so that a full expression could be given as we gather in worship. Used as a as a tool for correction and development, Luther believed that musical instruction presented the possibility to taste with wonder, yet not to comprehend God's absolute and perfect wisdom in his wondrous work of music. Music, Luther believed, could arouse devotion and is a tool of the Holy Spirit. Singing is a tool of the Holy Spirit. Thus, God through the Holy Spirit is active when we sing. In a, in a letter sometime written around the year 1530, Luther wrote a draft on music titled Concerning Music. In this letter, we, we first see Luther writing that music was a gift from God and that it can create a joyful heart and that the devil cannot remain in its presence and that music creates an atmosphere of delight and humility. He was certainly quite fond of music, and Luther purposed to, to, to be sure to not push his love for music without first giving it a solid, firm theological foundation and understanding. The sacramental uh, view of music and worship was, was not necessarily Luther's aim, but as we look at uh, his angle of looking at things, one can devise this idea from his various writings. So that is a quick view at uh, three historical case studies of this idea of uh, the sacrament, sacramentality of music and worship. And next, as our last segment, uh, we will look at a theological perspective of music and worship as sacramental. So first we looked at a biblical perspective, then we looked at a historical perspective, and then next we will look at a theological perspective. So here it comes. Well, here we are with our third part, the, um, the theological perspective of music in worship as sacramental. And as you can see, it is, uh, it's dark outside. And uh, so I've been working on this for a little while today. And uh, so I may be a little tired, but let's get through this. We can do this. So, so here we go. Uh, we've looked at a biblical perspective, a historical perspective, and now we're going to look at a theological perspective of music and worship as a sacramental idea. And uh, in general, uh, the theologians that, um, that uh, we will be discussing in these videos have been across various backgrounds and such, and uh, we will continue the same here uh, with them coming from various worship traditions, such as Reformed um, Evangelical, Methodist, Presbyterians, and Pentecostals or Charismatics. So to give a little transparency for those who do not know this, the, the Pentecostal church is the church of, of, my, of my youth. It's my worship tradition of my childhood. And um, though with hopes, I've tried to remain neutral in that fact as I've looked into what theologians have had to say about the sacramental idea of music in worship. So now to this idea, the broader Pentecostal church has embraced the belief and posture that God can and does perform uh, special acts during our worship, especially in music. 
Thus, corporate worship is attended with great at- anticipation at these churches uh, of what uh, miraculous works God might choose to do that day. So, uh, though not officially or verbally deemed a sacramental act by Pentecostals or uh, or uh, Charismatics or Spirit-filled churches, you know, however you uh, classify them, uh, it is believed most certainly that God is present and um, and that He is active as they sing. So it has been estimated that up to 30 to 40 percent of a worship service around the country is comprised of music. Now this has not always been the case. Uh, the frontier tradition uh, some many many decades ago sparked an outreach, a revival if you will, where the, the meetings gave a strong foundation for worship. These meetings sparked what's now known as the Pentecostal worship tradition. Now, in regard to this new worship tradition, James White, we talked about him earlier, an evangelical theologian, uh, Mr. White writes, it is the first post-enlightenment tradition in referring to the Pentecostals in that it has no inhibitions about experiencing the reality of God's presence in worship. Sacraments, he goes on to say, may seem a bit tame since the evidence of God's present activity is already so overwhelming. So things like communion with the Lord's Supper weren't being recognized as often because of their recognition of God being present so evident through their worship in music. It was encounters like these with God's presence that uh, set these Pentecostal worship services apart from all others. Dr. Delton Alford, a primary and well-respected music theologian in the Pentecostal church, writes this. From its inception around the turn of the 20th century, Pentecostal music quickly became known for its congregational and individual participation in enthusiastic, fervent, and spiritual singing of gospel hymns, gospel songs, and praise songs. Now, as as Pentecostals look to the New Testament as a guide for the flow of their worship services, they adopted the idea and belief that the Holy Spirit is active and desirous to do a special work in their midst for the then and the there. The supernatural experienced and manifested uh, was uh, was manifested through their worship. They believed. Um, and believe the purpose of music in worship is to turn hearts to God as he inhabits the praises of his people. Music isn't simply just something to gather people together to make some wonderful music together. Paul W. Walker, a well-respected leader and pastor in the Pentecostal movement, says this, In its highest capacity, music prepares the heart of the believer to receive God's blessings It sets the spiritual tone of the service. It guards against formalism and intellectualism as the very heart of the believer is thrust through song to God. Even Martin Luther, John Calvin, and John Wesley, all non-Pentecostals, knew there was something special in the worship through music. Delton Offord once again uh, tells us, When a congregation engages in song in a spirited manner, there can be a recognized and special presence of God, no matter the church affiliation. Now, Pentecostals have been known to evaluate their music like their sermons. They'd say statements like, I didn't get much out of the worship to get, uh, I didn't get much out of the worship today. Now, maybe you've heard statements like that before. It's so unfortunate statement because, um, you know, it's not that God wasn't manifest that day. Um, In his evaluation of the Pentecostal worship experience in music, theologian D.A. Carson writes this, while some Christians might assume they had worshiped because they had sung or praised uh, words that expressed God's glory 
the charismatic or Pentecostal will also look for some personal sense of having made contact with God. That is a matter of feeling, hopefully not merely of emotions, but also of spiritual awareness. So those with a spiritual field leaning arrive to to a given worship experience. They arrive to church with an anticipation of God doing something unique that day in that very hour. D.A. Carson continues to say that those gathered will insist that sense of power comes because the Holy Spirit is moving among his people as they worship. But let us remember, simply because you did not feel or recognize God's presence does not mean he was not there. We know he was there. As we assemble for worship, actually he is there already before us. James White encourages us with with this statement. All Pentecostal or spirit-filled worship is sacramental in manifesting visibly and audibly within the gathered, within those of us who have come to church, the action and presence of the Holy Spirit. And I say, amen. Delton Alford and D.A. Carson, both theologians that we've been just discussing, have given us a vantage point from a more established church perspective. Now, Now let us look at a little bit more of a current viewpoint on how the contemporary worship movement holds to this kind of sacramental idea of music in worship. A, uh, a more modern sacramental view of music started back in the 1940s with a scripture-based song. And as it, as it happens, the Pentecostal church gave great usage for these kind of scripture songs because it, it was singing God's word in worship. The birthing of the scripture song, along with the various models of worship, of like following the Davidic tabernacle of worship, which was essentially, uh, we're coming from the outer court into the inner court, into the Holy of Holies and such. This brought us what was eventually known as praise and worship music, probably now a term that uh, you are quite familiar with. And according to worship music theologians and historians, Sui Hong Lim and Lester Ruth, in considering the contemporary worship movement across the decades, the theological viewpoint of God's presence active during our singing has led us, and they say this, to develop this idea of divine presence through congregational song into systems of theology and piety, which might be called sacramental, if we allow this term to refer to a general notion of encounter with God's presence. So what has become assumed uh, is that the worship leader can lead a congregation into the presence of God. This is accomplished through the choice of songs, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, and the congregation's desire to, to follow their leader into this special place. Sound familiar? Uh, it's, it's very familiar to what we uh, love and experience at Thompson Station Church and, and many other churches around the country and around the world. Now, sometimes we can wrongly uh, place a leader or a song on a pedestal. And uh, to this idea, M- Michael Coleman, the former executive producer for uh, Hosanna Music, a very, very popular contemporary worship company of the 1980s. Matter of fact, I... I I got to work there for seven years of my career. Mike states this, praise and worship music is only a vehicle into God's presence. In other words, don't worship worship. God is the focus of our worship. Praise and worship music is just one aspect of a praise and worship lifestyle. Music is the vehicle, but the goal is God's presence. Amen. Now, it can, it can be easy to point fingers at Pentecostals for the emotional expressiveness engaged and encouraged in its worship services. But in the same breath, Protestants have been at fault as well 
for suppressing expressions in worship. So that's been unfortunate. It, it has been the Pentecostals, the charismatic spirit-filled kind of worship traditions that have encouraged the, the type of uh, free expression now available in a lot of churches around the world. Contemporary worship music is not going away uh, anytime soon. And to its continued growth, there have been several scripture passages one might associate with it that, that laid the groundwork for, for what is now the current praise and worship music. Psalm 96.1 is a popular one. And it simply says, sing to the Lord a new song. But, but there are far more uh, revered uh, contributing scriptures. And here's two of them in specific. Psalm 22.3. Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. And then Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. These scriptures give a strong sense that God's presence could be experienced in a special way through corporate worship, and that the acts in a certain way could facilitate the experiencing of divine presence and power. And by the, by the 1980s, a sort of sacramental theology of music in worship had arrived in churches around the country. In, in this 1980s idea of utilizing a Davidic tabernacle worship model gave way to the sequencing and the building of a song list with consideration of things like theme and key and tempo and lyrics. Uh, very much something that we recognize today. This formula that was being utilized in these Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled uh, types of churches began to be um, adopted by churches outside of those traditions. Uh, so not just by uh, the Pentecostals, the Charismatics, but uh, you know, the, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, and so forth, began to adopt these models. Now, however, as they embraced the, the song formula, they did so with a different focus, as it turns out. You know, not as a blanket statement, but uh, you know, in some generalities, they did so with a different focus. The Spirit-filled churches, of course, kept approaching the music as a, as a way of encountering God. But as it turns out, these other churches, they, they began to start contemporary worship services utilizing the same musical content, but with a purposed goal of attracting new people because it was something new. It was something unique. It was it was. Uh, you know, something different that had been going on across the decades previous. Now, uh, to be fair, all are worthy efforts in reaching people with the gospel. So it's not that one was necessarily wrong or right. It's just uh, the form that was being utilized was birthed in this scenario, now being utilized over in this one that didn't have the original heartbeat with it. Uh, Chuck Fromm, the founder of Worship Leader magazine uh, that maybe you've heard of, uh, Chuck once said to Bob Weber, uh, who was the, the founder again of, of, of my academic institution and now passed away, but a brilliant theologian on the aspect of worship. Uh, Chuck said to, to Bob one day, he said, you know, it used to be that when people moved into town, they asked, where is the best preaching? Today they ask, where is the best worship? You too have probably asked a similar question or have, have pondered that as you've moved into a particular place or visiting a particular city. You're thinking about what's the, what's the experience with music in that aspect of worship rather than, than the sermon itself. So an intriguing shift that's been occurring. So um, the modern worship song with its roots with the troops in the Pentecostal or charismatic worship traditions and experiences has been birthed as a personal encounter with God. That was, that was the heart of it. That's why it became into existence. So what is remarkable to learn of the many mainline churches who also utilize songs from uh, the primary Pentecostal 
charismatic worship bands of today. So it's intriguing to, to find out how many non-Pentecostal, non-charismatic churches are utilizing so many of the songs that are being birthed uh, out of these types of congregations. So for instance, Hillsong Church in Australia, Hillsong Worship, Elevation Worship, Jesus Culture, Vertical Church Band, Gateway Church, and Bethel Music. These are maybe uh, church music brands that you were familiar with, the worship uh, companies. These are all out of Pentecostal and Charismatic congregations. Um, Hillsong Church is an Assemblies of God congregation, and a lot of people don't know that. Don't know that. Sorry, it's it's been a long day. Uh, so uh, so Pete Ward says this about this kind of uh, idea. He says the songs of the Charismatic movement have been written not simply to express or speak about an encounter with God through worship. It's not just about an encounter. The songs are rather themselves individual narratives of an encounter itself. So as we've seen, the idea of, of music and worship uh, can be shown to give something uh, special of an encounter with God as we sing and as we play our instruments. Again, scripture tells us to do it. It gives us a command, if you will. And as we look at scripture, we can even see that, that, that Jesus himself encouraged singing. So why not music in worship be a sacramental uh, act of our hearts? That as we sing, uh, that there's something special between us and the heavenlies, that God is uniquely present as we sing. So I, I thank you for being on this journey with me and that uh, you have found, found out something unique about the uh, music. And so does music bring us closer to God? Well, Ben Fielding, one of the, uh, the writers at Hillsong Music at Hillsong Church says this. He says, yes. In musical worship, we can experience change, be convicted by the Spirit of God, experience freedom, repent, surrender areas of our lives that we have held back from God, and importantly, develop unity as we agree in Jesus' name. And I say, amen. So thank you for being on this journey with me. I do hope that you have learned a good bit about uh, what can and does happen as we sing and as we play our instruments. It's not a flippant action. We should never ever take uh, what we do is just singing some simple songs in church about God. Because as, as we're singing in church about God, He is present with us. Uh, as we do our part in creating a space where God can and will do miraculous acts as we help create a space for his people as we worship in song. All right, so there you go, that's it. So thank you for being a part of this with me. And don't forget, there's the one last survey that I now uh, would like for you to go do that for me, get that information back to me as soon as you can so I could be crunching all this data and uh, getting my final project wrapped up for submission. So again, Thank you, thank you, thank you. And God bless, and uh, I'll see you around Thompson Station Church. Bye.